We're going on assignment with the Voice of America. Hello and welcome to another edition of On Assignment. I'm Ibrahim Siddiqui. And I'm Alex De La Real. In this episode, VOA's Steve Herman shares stories from the Philippines after the nation's devastating typhoon. We look at Pakistan and China and their evolving trade relationship. Breast cancer affects women everywhere, including one of VOA's own. We'll have her story. And it's up, up and away. NASA's MAVEN satellite heads to Mars. We'll get the inside scoop from the launch. On Assignment is on the air, and we begin in 3, 2, 1, liftoff. It's affected more than 13 million people, including millions displaced and nearly 7,000 dead or missing. We're talking about Typhoon Haiyan, which hit the central Philippines on November 8th. VOA correspondent Steve Herman was in the Philippines covering the disaster, and he joins us now to talk about what he saw. Steve, uh, thank you for being on the show. Take us back to the beginning. After you arrived in the Philippines, that first moment uh, when you stepped out, how would you describe the level of destruction? Well, when we first arrived, we really had no accurate means to describe the level of destruction. That was only possible with some accuracy when we were able days later uh, to get in a U.S. military Seahawk helicopter and fly over at low altitude both Leyte and Samar Islands. And that's when we saw that there were not only cities such as Tacloban that had suffered near total destruction, but likely hundreds of smaller towns and villages. Steve, how do you, how do you or any other reporter for that matter, uh, how does one cover an, a, a disaster of such magnitude? Well, it's uh, sheer tenacity and a lot of luck. Um, in this case, the logistics were a huge challenge. The, the only sensible way to get to the worst hit areas quickly um, uh, was on these U.S. military flights. And we were initially told that we could only carry what we could hold on our laps and that while the, the military could give us uh, an airlift in, there was no guarantee we could get a ride out. And considering... You know, that Tacloban and other areas we were going to or wanted to go to did not have any food, drinking water, ground tra transportation, or electricity. It uh, was pretty daunting. Steve, you talk about challenges for reporters in a situation like this, but there were also challenges getting humanitarian aid into the country. Tell us about that. Well, I think there was sort of a stunned inaction initially because communications were cut off to Tacloban and the in the other hardest hit uh, communities. So nobody really had an initial sense of just how bad this was. And then the real problem wasn't really getting into the Philippines or getting the aid in the Philippines, but getting it into the worst hit areas. There were these uh, choke points at uh, sea and airports, and uh, there just weren't enough personnel to handle the significant influx, which is still coming in. A lot of policemen were killed. The military wasn't in place. The Philippines military, except for the army, has very few assets when it comes to its Navy and Air Force, only has uh, two or three working C-130 cargo planes. Tacloban Airport itself was severely damaged and for some time. It could only operate during daylight hours and for a while there was even talk that there would need to be an amphibious landing by U.S. Marines on Leyte and, and Samar to, to, to get help in. If you could quickly tell us in 10 seconds, there was an emergency radio station that was set up because everything was shut down in Tacloban. What happened? Well, they had a portable studio and transmitter that fit in uh, two small suitcases that had been poised in Manila, and they were able to fly this in uh, 72 hours after the disaster hit and get this uh, up and running. Well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, viewer correspondent Steve Herman. Yeah, Steve, thank you. We really appreciate all your hard work and your reporting there in the Philippines. We are taking a break now. When we come back, Pakistan hopes for a boost from its northern neighbor. You're watching On Assignment.
Pakistan's economy is at a standstill and many in the South Asian country are looking hopefully to China for a badly needed economic boost. VOA Islamabad correspondent Sharon Bain talked with local vendors in Pakistan about what they think their northern neighbor can do to help. I talked with Sharon about this focus on investment and trade. Let's start with part of Sharon's report. Chinese food is a favorite for Pakistan's middle class and Chinese goods are flooding the market. Businesswoman Yong Fa represents a group of Chinese manufacturers in Pakistan. I want to export to Pakistan about electronic items for, uh, such as uh, mobile phone, TV and with a lower price. China is Pakistan's fifth largest investor, with the U.S. and Britain still in the lead. Now, the, the sense in Pakistan is that China is ready to invest in so many of the different sectors in Pakistan and help the country grow. But China is known to have strategic investment uh, taking place, which is, of course, to benefit their own uh, geopolitical uh, uh, interests and agendas. What is your sense? What's, what's going on over there? I think you're right. You know, I think that China thinks in a very strategic way. They see uh, you know, Pakistan as, as having a port down in the south that's very useful for them, for their, the western side of, of China. But yeah, I think they think very strategically. They have a partnership that they can develop. They think strategically next, in, in next door in Afghanistan. They're beginning to you know, talk to India. So I think China has a very uh, long-term strategic interest in Pakistan. In Pakistan, when you when you see how the relationship is described, it's a sort of a, a lot of brotherly love, and and they they're very convinced, or there there are people who are very convinced that China is going to come in and just fix all of Pakistan's economic problems, of which there are many. And what about the local manufacturers or retailers? Are they afraid that there's going to be an explosion of cheap goods, and you'll have stores like, for example, Walmart in the U.S. This actually, has, this is kind of a mixed reaction. So in, in the markets, for example, um, in the China market and, and where you can get all these goods like refrigerators, air conditioners, generators, clothes, toys, and you name it, you can get cheap Chinese goods here. So there's, it's very welcomed by a lot of people who can't afford it otherwise. You know, there, there is an economic pinch here. So all of these Chinese goods are, are things that people can now afford. They can afford it and they want it and they buy it. Um, the people selling it, the traders, they're doing really well. They can go up. China's not that far away. You know, they can go up there. They get goods. They bring it down, and they're doing a really good business. But yeah, you know, on the manufacturing side, um, Pakistan actually manufactures pretty very high quality cotton goods, and they export that to the United States. What's coming in from China is a sort of a lower scale lower scale kind of cotton. So it's it's not really threatening their their manufacturing sector right right at this moment. Um, I don't think they're competing that much. But it's it's that um, but it's definitely not helping Pakistan develop its own manufacturing sector. And China is a, you know in in all its areas it, it is like that for most most of this area, most of the region. It can provide goods at an incredibly cheap price. They do have very some very strong manufacturing sectors, but they're not developing into new sectors. And uh, they're not being able to pick up on that. They have power cuts all the time. They're energy cuts all the time. So even if you're trying to run a factory, if you're trying to, and you have a, an energy cut, a power cut for 10 hours, you have to rely on alternative fuels. This is going to make things more expensive. So that there, there's more than, it's not just the competition. There's, there's so much within Pakistan itself that needs to get fixed. VOA correspondent Sharon Bain in Islamabad. Shannon reports the trade imbalance between Pakistan and China remains heavily in China's favor as Pakistan has few exports. Meanwhile, China's direct investment in Pakistan is still relatively small. Well, we are taking another break. On the other side, the heavy toll of breast cancer through the life and lens of a former VOA colleague who knows it all too well. You're watching On Assignment. Breast cancer is the most common form of cancer in women worldwide. In 2010, more than 1.6 million women heard the words, you have breast cancer, with higher rates in developed countries such as the United States. Much of the news about breast cancer focuses on the latest treatments or screenings, but the disease also has a face. 
many faces. One of those is former VOA producer Zulima Palacio, whose reports we have featured a number of times on this program. VOA health reporter Carol Pearson profiled Zuli and her battle with breast cancer, and I talked with both of them. Let's take a look. They are all based on eucalyptus. Zulima Palacio did everything right. Yes, she did it. She exercised, walked daily with her husband or a friend. <laughs> oh, you mean? Maintained good health and had regular mammograms. Even a month before it was detected, I went for a sonogram and they told me, you're fine, go home. At the beginning, you get kind of numb and I didn't understand. All I, got, all I was thinking was, uh, why? There is no cancer in my family. I have done everything right. I have been into sports, very healthy, very positive. And so it was devastating. I had done everything right and it was devastating. So, Carol, coming from your, you know, health reporter perspective, how is it that a case like this can happen where still it goes undetected? The surgeon that I interviewed said finding a tumor in someone's breast, in a dense breast, is like finding a polar bear in a snowstorm. Mm. It's very difficult. Although a lot of women, their tumors are detected at a much earlier stage with reg regular mammograms. Um, and the doctors tell me that 3D tomography is better than a regular mam mammogram, so you have a 3D picture. But there's still people that get their cancers missed. Now let's talk about the series. It was a five-part series, Carol, that you produced about Zuli's experience with breast cancer. It's a, it's a very exposed uh, position for you to be in, so what did that do for your relationship as women and colleagues? Well, I had covered breast cancer before, and in fact, I had interviewed a doctor who does radio programs to Latin America and the Latin American community in the United States. And over and over and over again, what you hear are women in other countries, they wait until it's way too late to have anything done about their, you know, their cancer. And, and Zuli, being from Colombia, knows that this is true. Yeah. And I said, what? We could do something, Zuli, that would educate women around the world. And then it was like a journey for the two of us because we had never been through this, me as an observer, Zuli as a patient. Um, well, I, I have to say something. I think that if it had come probably from, a, from an outsider, I don't know if I would have opened up, but it was Carol. Mm -hmm. And so when your friend and your uh, partner of many years walking and uh, asked you to do this and perhaps help other women, I said yes. Zuli Palacio's husband, Chris Condetti, takes her to every one of her six rounds of <laughs> chemotherapy to combat stage three breast cancer. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Palacio had a medical device surgically implanted in her chest. And one, two, three, take a deep breath. To make it easier, if not less painful, to deliver the drugs. Palacio says the hardest part is the injection the day after the chemotherapy session. The day after that injection, you feel like if a train hit you, your body flew through a black cloud, and you land in a cement bed. I, I do want to talk more about chemo. Um, so talk to us about that process, losing your hair, and then what you've gone through. Uh, losing this your is hair is a hard one. Um, all of a sudden, you are like a Buddhist monk, mm -hmm. and you look at yourself and say, holy cow, what happened to me, you know? And then um, all your eyelashes and every, every piece of hair falls off. And uh, so I, my friends organized a, a, scarf, a, a, scarf, a scarf party for me, and we had a ball. Then I was able in front of my friends to be without it and try all the scarves that, and hats. And, um, <laughs> and that looks was good, the look that you have today. That's looks a nice. wig. Yes. That's a wig. This decision to have a double mastectomy, know, you mentioned, Carolyn, through your reporting of Zuli's experience, that even your doctors weren't recommending it. So how difficult was that decision for you? It is a difficult decision, and mine was based in the fact that I always thought that if one day I could have breast cancer, it would have been in the right. There was always something there in the right breast. Divine, had had a and I had biopsies in the right breast, breast more than twice. And I decided, instinct, I'm going to follow my body. And 
I have it, even if the doctor says, no, I want a double mastectomy because it would be a matter of time for me to have the cancer on the right. Reflecting back on the series and on this experience, you could pinpoint um, your mission with this and what you hope Walk that earth, people around the world take from it. For me, that there's no stigma to any disease and that diseases, if they can be treated, need to be treated. Yeah. If this series can help one woman, I'll be happy. Mm. Well, thank you both. It's great to talk to you. Thank you for being Now you want to see my hair? Yes. <laughs> oh, if, if, if you're okay to show it. There yes. you go. Okay, here we go. Uh, there. Oh, it's coming in. It's coming in like a baby's yes. hair. Touch it. Can I touch it? An extremely powerful and personally touching story from our former VOA producer Zuli Palacio and our current health reporter Carol Pearson. Be sure to check out Carol's five-part series on Zuli and breast cancer at voanews.com. And if you need more information on how to identify changes in your own breasts, visit the American Cancer Society at cancer.org. All right, moving on to a story that's out of this world, and that's literally. On November 18th, the U.S. space agency NASA launched its new MAVEN Mars satellite. It will be the first spacecraft to investigate the red planet's upper atmosphere and climate. After a 10-month flight, MAVEN will begin its year-long mission in low orbit around Mars. VOA Urdu Service reporter Abdul Aziz Khan went to Cape Canaveral, Florida for the launch of MAVEN and talked about it with On Assignment's Philip Alexio. Aziz, NASA's launched another spacecraft uh, heading to Mars. So tell us basically what its mission is all about. Uh, Philip, uh, MAVEN stands for Mars Atmosphere Volatile Evolution Mission. And basically the objective of this space flight is to send a robotic spaceship in the um, atmosphere of Mars and try to figure out how Mars lost, lost its water. Because we know from previous missions that there was a time when Mars has had an atmosphere similar to ours. It had, um, it had an ocean, it had clouds, and then something happened in these last four billion years that it has become this, this dead planet. So one of the greatest mysteries associated with Mars was where did the atmosphere go, and that is why the MAVEN mission has been launched. Now there have been a good number of satellites that have been launched to Mars, there's something like 20 of them over the past several decades, but this particular one does other things, right? Absolutely. Well, in terms of sending a spaceship to Mars, um, MAVEN is not attempting to do anything different. So in that regard, it's not different, but what we have to realize is that the previous missions were basically sent to raise questions. Okay. And uh, this is one mission that has been uh, designed from the ground up to provide answers. Yes, okay. And in order to do that, they have a series of sensors which would be um, uh, documenting data on such minuscule level that by the time all this data comes back, we are hoping that we would have answers to a lot of questions. So in that regards, it's a very important uh, mission. Then it has three different sensor packages, and a lot of these are designed by the University of Colorado. And each sensor would have a team of scientists that would be decoding the uh, mission data. So um, uh, purely from a scientific point of view, hopes are obviously very high as far as this mission is concerned. And I mean, it's interesting uh, that um, you know in the next 10 or 11 months, we could have a lot of information that could, you know, uh, uh, totally changed the way we have been seeing Mars. Was this the first time you've seen a rocket launch? Yes. Well, tell me what it is like. What do you experience? You just can't get it on, you know, watching a video. Uh, Philip, it was so different than what I had imagined it to be all my life. Because I was thinking I was part of the media and I would be able to see the spaceship up close, right? But they took us on these buses and they put us on this island from where there was this huge ocean between us and the spaceship and nobody was allowed to go any closer. And I was thinking, dang, you know, I mean, this, um, I can barely see the spaceship. So I asked them, why is it that we are not allowed to go any closer? And I was told that you will not be able to withstand the, uh, the sound of the jet wash. And it did not make any sense to me because the spaceship was so tiny. But when the spaceship took off, and as it moved farther and farther up, uh, there was a point when we were directly under the jet wash radius. 
and I could literally feel the ground shake under me. So at that point, the um, it, it, everything started to make sense why people are not allowed to uh, you know view these spectacles from a closer proximity. Now tell me that this launch, it was possible that it might not have happened in an unusual fashion. Yes. What, what's the story behind that? Uh, well, um, the U.S. government was um, undergoing a shutdown and the mission date had been planned years and years in advance because in order for the spaceship to actually reach Mars, Earth and Mars have to be um, uh, at a specific distance. And the opportunity window is like 20 days. Now, is it true that the government shutdown could have killed this mission? Oh, yes, we were very concerned about the government shutdown. And if we had missed this, um, this several week window, we would have to wait uh, about two years. Uh, and that actually would have cost uh, a couple hundred million dollars to put our spacecraft in cold storage. So uh, that would not have been good. So they had to work on double shifts to uh, basically make that launch. And they did make that launch, but uh, it was a very crucial mission and sitting at home for two and a half days was extremely frustrating for these guys. Well, thank goodness it didn't happen and you got to go see it. Good for you. Thank you so much. Buddy. All right, Aziz Khan from UrduVOA.com. It is just amazing to see what technology can do, isn't it? Now, Imran, while MAVEN is going to Mars, scientists here on Earth are interested in getting a better look at our galaxy's many asteroids. Mm -hmm. Well, depending on their size, asteroids can pose a grave threat to all life on our planet. VOA's Adam Phillips has more about what might be done to prevent a fateful rendezvous with one of these. For decades, Hollywood films like Deep Impact and Armageddon have let moviegoers enjoy the terror of fictional earthbound asteroids from the safety of their seats. But on February 15th of this year, residents of Chelyabinsk in central Russia discovered that the threat posed is as real as it gets. That meteorite wounded more than a thousand people, a pinprick compared to the one that probably wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and far more benign than the meteor that exploded over Siberia in 1908, leveling more than 2,000 square kilometers of forest, or the meteorite that hit present-day Arizona 50,000 years ago and made a crater large enough to swallow up the entire city of San Francisco. But those strikes were no flukes. There are an estimated 10,000 known asteroids orbiting our region of the inner solar system. That's just 1% of the million or more asteroids scientists believe to be our near neighbors in the inner solar system. Asteroids are chunks of dark, mineral-rich rock that reflect almost no sunlight, but infrared sensors on a space-based telescope could detect the heat they've absorbed from the sun. That will be the job of the Sentinel Deep Space Telescope, bristling with infrared sensors along with mapping and communications gear. The Sentinel mission is the brainchild of former astronaut Edward Liu and his B612 Foundation, which is committed to reducing the asteroid threat. Sentinel is scheduled to launch in 2018. Once the asteroids are spotted and their orbits determined, an Earth-bound asteroid can be nudged slightly off course with a satellite deflector or a high-velocity projectile, or blown up with nuclear weapons, causing it to miss its deadly rendezvous. Much like movie makers imagined it would be in the 1958 science fiction film The Day the Sky Exploded. We're saved. But this time, it's the real world that would be saved. Adam Phillips, VOA News, New York. And with that, it's time for us to say goodbye. Next week, we'll take a look at global views on the nuclear agreement being worked out with Iran and world powers. In the meantime, you can watch all our episodes on VOANews.com, Facebook, and YouTube. We are so thankful for all of our viewers. And we'd like to give a shout out this week to those watching on assignment on Chorus Group TV in Sofia, Bulgaria, and on Sky TV in Liberia. Hey, way to go, Liberia, Bulgaria. Yes. Sofia, how do you guys I do? also want to give a shout out to someone else Who? here, which is, would be you. Oh, why is that? You have some big news. Oh yeah, I took an oath to be a citizen of the United States. Yes, you are now an American citizen, so I am we welcome you. Proud to be one. We're Thank very you so much. excited for you. Congratulations. Took a, took a long time, but happy to be here. Yes. All right. Well, until next time. So long from all of us here at On Assignment. Thank you so much for watching.